webinar. Before we continue, how many of you need the Italian translation? C'è qualcuno qui che ha bisogno della traduzione in italiano? Ok, facciamo una prova. Ok, se si mette le cuffie. Ok. E per accendere l'audio um, c'è un, un pulsante accanto, non, non sopra ma accanto l'apparecchio la davanti a, a voi, non, non sopra ma accanto, sì sì. E il canale, quale canale utilizziamo oggi per italiano? Uno? O quattro, ok. Il canale da scegliere è il numero quattro. Ok, adesso facciamo una prova. Se va bene la traduzione, if the translation is coming well in Italian. Senti bene la traduzione? Sì? Ok, perfetto. Quan when later in the program we open the mics, at that point, in order to turn on your mics, you can use the button that's on top. Ok? That will be when you'd like to speak and use the microphone. If more than one person puts the microphone on, we're going to hear feedback. Okay. The one last thing before we, before we move into the actual meeting is the, the meeting today is going to be live streamed and then it will also go up onto YouTube. So we'd like to know if everyone here is okay with their image possibly going online. If you do not want your image online, if you could raise your hand, please. Okay, so everyone's okay with their image going online. It looks like we have. Okay. I'd like to give a word about the presentation and then I will introduce Sister Judette, who is joining us via webinar. After Sister Judette will present us a little bit about conversion of heart, which is the theme for today, we will spend about 20 minutes here and then those who are online can participate in a chat together. Here we'll do it verbally and those of you online can do it through the the chat by typing. After the 20 minute break where we're talking together, etc., we will then be able to have time for feedback with Sister Judette and questions. We can ask her questions. So at that point, we'll open the floor to whatever you'd like to ask her. This is your opportunity, okay? I just want to make sure that, that we've resolved uh, the translation here. Um, can we do a little bit of translation to see if... Okay, it looks like... Oh, perfect. We're good to go. Okay. So Sister Judette Galares is a Senegal sister. She's from the Philippines. And she's involved in the Ministry of Retreat and Spiritual Direction and Formation. She studied at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, at Fordham University in New York, the Graduate Theological Foundation, and at Oxford University in England for her graduate and then postgraduate degrees. And presently, she is a professor of the Theology of Consecrated Life at the Institute for Consecrated Life in Asia, and she's a visiting professor of theology at the University of St. Joseph in Macau in China, where she teaches 
theological anthropology and aesthetic theology. She is on the editorial board of Religious Life Asia, and she's a contributing editor of Orientis Aura, the journal of the University of St. Joseph Faculty of Religious Studies. She's authored several books and articles on biblical spirituality, religious formation, and consecrated life. And today we have with us one of her books, Journeys of the Heart. So this one is now available in Rome, and we do hope to keep it in stock at our store. But we have it here today, should you wish. So let's give a warm welcome to Sister Judette joining us from Macau. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, or uh, it's evening here in Macau, so good morning there. Uh, I feel privileged to be invited to be a speaker for this webinar, uh, the title of which is Opening the Heart to Listen. It is an ongoing, form, ongoing conversion. Um, I do have a few slides, uh, so let me just uh, say this. Uh, oh, share. Sorry. Um, okay. Let me just, uh, okay. So that's the title. Can you see it? Yes. So the basic meaning of conversion, I'd like to use uh, Bernard Lonergan's definition, is a shift in one's orientation towards life. And this shift does not happen once and for all, but it is a continuing process. That's why it is ongoing. It is from the very beginning up to the end of our life, we are invited to undergo this ongoing formation or conversion rather. So gender, but there are gender differences in communicating Christian conversion experiences. And uh, here, there is a ten tendency, for example, um, men tend to use adventurous metaphors and or dramatic events to describe their initial conversion experience, while women tend to use peaceful metaphors and or describe their conversion experience in simple ways. Uh, these gender differences are evident in the conversion stories of Paul. We all know the story, very dramatic, and that of Lydia, which appears in the Acts of the Apostles. When it comes to the story of Lydia's conversion, it only comprises two or three verses, whereas Paul's conversion, a very dramatic uh, description of it, happens in 22 verses. So I'd like to be able to show you that, uh, you know, there are differences in the way we um, describe or experience our conversion. Uh, on the side of the feminine conversion, there is the audacity, the risking to enact tr uh, truth boldly. So we can see this very much in uh, the story of Lydia. In the two or three verses, she boldly asked Paul to be baptized, not only for herself, but for the entire household. On the masculine conversion side, there is the experience of inadequacy to decenter against pride. And so we know very much the story of uh, Paul. He was full of pride to, in the sense that he wanted to, to really... Uh, you know, make sure that the Christians are going to be persecuted. And he went after the Christians, and it was on the road uh, that he experienced his conversion. But it was 
the dissentering against his pride. On the feminine conversion side, there is that element of repairing and renewing, to repair and to renew. So on the experience of Lydia, what needs to be repaired? Their spirituality, they were, they were God-fearers. They practiced the Jewish faith, but without understanding it. They went through the motion of the faith. It, they needed renewal in their spirituality. On the masculine side, there is the element of repenting in order to be renewed. And this was the experience of Paul. He experienced darkness. And in that darkness, he realized that he did not recognize the Lord. And he needed to be renewed in that. On the feminine conversion, it is to provide prophetic testimony. And the prophetic testimony that Lydia gave was that of accepting the foreigners and providing them hospitality. On the masculine side, the element is to provide urgent receptivity. And so for Paul, it was very important for him that he had to be accepted by the Christian community so that he will be able to proclaim the word of God. So I, I mentioned these differences because we have a tendency to uh, look at conversion in just a mono, uh, you know, just in one sense. But there are different elements that are involved in it. And let me uh, let you go through the five movements, and I will, I will use from, uh, from the feminine perspective, the five movements of ongoing conversion. The first is an experience of darkness or confusion. The second is awakening face. The third is a face of prophetic action. The fourth is a quiet face. And the fifth is integration face. Of course, this does not happen in this order. Sometimes we enter into a quiet phase. For instance, when we make a 30-day retreat, and then realize that we are being called to another phase, which is prophetic action. But I'd like to go through with you uh, these five stages or phases so that we can understand more based on our experience of life. For instance, um, in the first phase, which is the experience of darkness and confusion. I'm sure you can reflect on your life experiences as you listen to this. And I would like to describe it in this way. It is an awareness of emptiness that needs to be filled. It's a very Advent kind of a theme to experience our emptiness so that God will fill our life. Uh, it is also a period of questioning we have questions that beg for answers, but we do not have immediate answers. It is also a phase where we experience incongruities in our life, in ourselves, and life itself, which sometimes can become intolerable. Um, it is also the phase where we need to make decisions, and yet we postpone them for too long. It is also an experience of realities in our life being ignored, or there are personal agenda we table or we put aside. And eventually, in this phase, we realize that things have got to change. We have to make certain decisions. So almost all experiences of deep conversions seem to be preceded by some kind of difficulty, crisis, and questioning. It is an experience of inner conflict in search of a resolution, or an experience of aimlessness 
that seeks direction. So it would be helpful for our spiritual growth in this particular phase to ask ourselves these questions. What would be the deep longings and yearnings of our heart? This is a very good question to ask ourselves during this season of Advent. What incongruities do we begin to be aware of in our personal faith life or in the living out of our religious vocation? Would our various observances or external practices of religious life and spirituality be enough to fill the void and thirst for meaning? Or what kind of sharing must happen among us in order to form faith communities in mission? You will be provided with these questions later on, so uh, you don't have to copy them as I present them to you. So why do we ask ourselves these questions? Because these are the questions which will bring about in us growth. So these are the growth points experienced in the first phase of this conversion process. We have decisions, changes, transitions. Um, you know, like vocation discernment, for example, that's we need to make decisions, or there might be changes that we need to do with our personal life because we are going through maybe some sort of transition, such as midlife transition. So these are questions about our own commitment in life itself. Another growth point would be our spiritual crisis. There are moments in our life when we do experience dryness, emptiness. And there is a temptation to just forget about it. Uh, and yet, if we are called in this particular phase of conversion process, we need to enter into this crisis in order to know where God is leading us. There is also the growth point of reconsolidation or integration of self, especially after a period of crisis or difficulty. Because when we experience um, after difficulty, there are certain things that we need to adjust in our self-image, in the way we understand ourselves. Another growth point is the healing of the inner being. Um, maybe we experience deep forgiveness from God or experience uh, forgiveness from others, or experiencing forgiveness with ourselves. Because a lot of times, we are the last persons we want to forgive. So this is part of the healing of the inner being. And of course, whatever challenges that come to our life, challenges brought about by new mission, new community, uh, L eldering, illness, whatever they, the challenges are, these are areas where we are being invited to grow. So um, in this first space, we are invited to listen very deeply. So there are two dimensions in listening that is very important, that are very important. The first would be the psychological dimension. It is our capacity for self-intimacy, our capacity for self-awareness and self-acceptance. Because when we are going through difficulty, that there is a tendency not to accept ourselves. There is also the recognition of our own uniqueness and that of the other. And the capacity to listen to another, which we call empathetic listening. The second dimension is the spiritual dimension of listening. It is our capacity to listen and to be obedient to God's word in our life. 
and it asks of us a continuation of our relationship with God. And it implies a capacity for silence, a capacity to wait for God's word. Especially when we're going through dryness in our spiritual life or emptiness in our spiritual life, it is very difficult to wait for God's word. The tendency is to just stop praying. So the accent here in the spiritual dimension of listening is our own interiority. God's action in our person or God recognition that God is the source and ground of our being. It also speaks to our own prayer life, a listening which also sustains us through the questions and darkness. And even the courage to ask ourselves those questions that we're afraid to ask ourselves of. So this, this is the most difficult phase, in, in fact, because uh, a lot of people, when they experience this first phase, they want to give up. So the ongoing conversion does not happen if you give up. So when we stay faithful to this phase, it brings us to the second phase, which is the awakening phase. Our mystic spirit is awakened by the touch of God. Sometimes it can be just a word that is spoken to us. It primes us to listen intently to the word of life. Listening opens us up to our own inner longings and desires. So I'd like to use here from uh, the Song of Songs, uh, use it. Uh, it says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. I hear my love knocking, open to me, my sister, my beloved, my dove, my perfect one. And I'd like, that's why I, you, uh, I chose this particular passage because it speaks to me of how we as women experience ongoing conversion. Because for us women, the paradigm that speaks to us of conversion is more the awakening type. It is gradual, yet strengthening. Not the dramatic kind. It is deepening, unfolding of the mystery and meaning of one's faith. And therefore, there is a deepening or awakening of our faith. Our un interpenetrating connection to that which is the source of life. We begin to, to experience deep within us that there is life pulsating, that I'm invited to experience life. In the conversion experience, this space enables us to see what is happening around us what needs change, and what is God's call for us. So therefore, it is very important that we don't stop with the first phase, because otherwise, if we don't stay and be faithful and be uh, in our waiting for God, then God, we will miss the touch of God in our life. So this awakening phase calls us to our mystic spirit. And through contemplation, we are enabled to see I lost my say. Uh, to see uh, the world and the people we are called to serve from God's heart, from God's perspective. So the awareness is not only about me, but I begin to see the needs of people around me, the needs of the world. And therefore, there is the, that uh, awareness that something needs to be done. So in this phase, 
in this awakening phase. We realize our call to foster participation and harmony among all people. We realize that we need to foster healthy personal and interpersonal relationships, whether in community life or in the mission. We need to foster reverence for the earth, much more now when we see what is happening with our mother earth. And we need to foster an integration of spirituality and technology on behalf of the gospel. So in this awakening phase, these questions help us to see how God's word is touching us deeply. What and where these moments in our life, especially in our religious life and mission, was it after a time of crisis or an experience of God's healing touch and forgiveness? or while watching contemplatively the sunrise or sunset, it would be unique and different for each one of us. What kind of awakening is happening in our communities in front of concrete situations of injustice, of violence, of devastation, or what Situations and events in our country, our world, are awakening us, calling us to deeper prayer and to discern our prophetic action. So in the awakening phase, we continue to ask questions, but these questions lead us to the third stage or phase, which is the phase of prophetic action. It is an experience of an initial impetus of faith, a sudden surge of inspiration to put one's newfound conviction and belief into action. It is an experience of effusive change in our own attitude and values. It is actually uh, an experience of an ongoing transformation, which is part of ongoing conversion itself. So, uh, sorry. this phase of prophetic action is expressed, ex expressed differently. If we go back to the story of Paul, uh, immediately after a moment of, after the dramatic experience of Paul and his uh, um, healing and he was able to see again, he spent some time with the community. But the initial impetus of Paul is to preach. And he became very active in preaching the good news, even bringing it to uh, places that were never been, uh, that, that places and people who have never heard the gospel or the good news. For Lydia, it was very simple. His, her prophetic action is by offering hospitality. So we are called not to preach, not only to preach, but also to give witness to the virtue of hospitality in today's fragmented world, characterized by different levels and degrees of homelessness. So our prophetic call must open us up to others and to the world, offering ourselves, our communities, and our planet Earth as places of hospitality for humans and the whole of God's creation. We are called to true hospitality, to open the door of our heart to others in the spirit of prophetic mission. Many of us are called to mission in areas where there is so much conflict and environmental exploitation. 
All the more we are called to stretch our hearts to create a place for people who do not share our belief, our values, our culture, our background, and viewpoints. <coughs> we are called to listen with open hearts. That's why we need in this phase to reflect. If we were to open our heart and our home, who are those, those people I will invite to come and stay with me in my community, like in the spirit of Lydia. In what ways can we make our communities centers of hospitality and encounter with God? And we need also to reflect on what blocks me or my community from expressing this true spirit of hospitality. This brings us to the fourth phase, which is the quiet phase. So in the story of Lydia, the, the quiet phase happens since after the two verses about her conversion, we don't hear or see Lydia anymore, except in chapter or verse 40, where her home was offered to the Christian community. And with Paul, we know that he also spent a lot of time in silence before preparing himself as part of his preparation to preach the good news. So this quiet phase is simply a frequent faithful entering into the heart to listen and discern God's word in the world. What is God saying to the world today? What is God saying to me? And we can only hear if we are quiet. Quiet phase is important in order for change brought about by conversion to have its deep and lasting effect to happen, so a quiet phase is necessary after that stage where I am immersed in action, an ambulance stage. So this is a time of withdrawal, which is needed for contemplation and reflection. It is a time for making sense of what has happened to us. It is a time for testing the authenticity of our mystical experience. It is a time of internalizing the values put forth by the newly accepted and deepening faith. It is a time for discerning the appropriate prophetic action, which is not only once, that it does not only happen once, but it has to be an ongoing long-term commitment to action. So the prophetic tasks requires friendship and intimacy with God. It requires silence and stillness for spiritual self-discovery. And what is happening in many of our communities is that the lack of contemplative prayer in members of a community has contributed to the breakdown of faith communities in, in mission. That's why it is important that each person submit oneself to this ongoing process of ongoing conversion. This can become the primary source of discouragement, the lack of prayer rather, that this can become the primary source of discouragement and disappointment for its members. And communities can lose their prophetic edge in the process. We are just going to be immersing ourselves to work and we can become workaholics in the process without this element of contemplative prayer. So that's why it is important for us to ask the question, how could our, these questions, how could our prophetic vocation be sustained and deepened? And what are the everyday noises 
both inner and outer, that block us from entering into silence or distract us from God's presence. So that's the fourth stage, which brings us now to the fifth uh, phase, which is the integration phase. It is a phase where we experience an ongoing life of prayer, which is important. Perhaps not as prolonged periods of prayer as in the previous phase, but it is entering into habitual moments of reflection that will help us integrate our change of attitude, perspective, and belief in our own history. And life. It is a, a phase where a synthesis is being formed of all the parts of the mystical and prophetic experience of conversion. So this integration phase will enable us to face many challenges facing religious life today. Um, sorry. Uh, we are challenged to invest our spiritual and material resources in service for the poor, the marginalized, as well as for the structural change, first of all, in our communities on behalf of God's people and the earth community. So the spiritual dimensions of this integration phase is very important for us to look into. Because what is happening here is that the experience of the previous phases of the ongoing conversion process will come to be clearer to us. So what the apparent loss of meaning in actually is that we experience in the first phase is actually a quest for integral relatedness, creative growth, and permanent fulfillment. The experience of the darkness, the difficulty in praying and so forth is inviting us to see it as a moment or a time of solitude. It's a solitude of aloneness, not loneliness, but a solitude of aloneness, which is a place of self-discovery. The emptiness, the emptiness of depression that we might experience in the first two phases is actually a time of a search for fulfillment and joy. Or the change that stirs anxiety in us in the various phases is actually a movement towards permanence of commitment. Because we are being asked, are we really committed to the choices we have made in our life? The dark burden of guilt that we might have experienced, especially in the first phase of conversion, is actually a summons to the lightsomeness of autonomy. The lethargy of boredom can also be seen in this integration phase as a thirst for enthusiasm. And the lifelessness of apathy is actually an invitation to retreat in order to re-enter life itself. So whatever pain of anguish we might have experienced is a breakdown in order for God to break through. So it is an invitation to view problems as opportunities to view crisis as a chance for change and chaos as a birthplace 
of creation. So the ongoing conversion is an experience of transformation following the pattern of Christ's Paschal mystery. Thus, we can say with Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians, the following verses. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are knocked down, but not destroyed. Always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our body. So the ongoing conversion is a lifetime process itself. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sister Judette. We really did appreciate your presentation, especially also the images that accompanied it. I think the images also um, perhaps spoke to us a bit as well. So as I said, we'll go ahead and we'll take 20 minutes now. Um, that will bring us to about uh, 1210, okay? And if you'd like, feel free for those of you in the room to join another group if you'd like. And then at about 1210, we will then open both the mics here in the room and then also the chat room in the, in the webinar, which is already open for all of you to, to begin discussing what you've heard in order to be able to present questions or feedback to Sister Judette, okay? So we'll be back again at about 1210 Rome time. Okay, <laughs> here we are again. We, I'd like to invite any of you who are connected by webinar, if you have a question, um, you can raise your hand. It's one of the icons that you should be able to see. And we should be able to have you ask your question. We'll unmute your microphone. And you should be able to ask your question out loud. If you may not have, if you may not be connected by microphone, please feel free to ask your question or give us your feedback through the chat section. Okay. Do we have anything from the floor yet? Would any of you like to give some feedback, ask a question? How about online? Do we have anyone on the webinar who has indicated they have a question? No. I, I'll go ahead and start then. Um, Sister Judette, you already saw my comment on the chat. I appreciated the, it was just one phrase that, that Sister used between the the connection between the spiritual life and the use of technology. And I'm making the assumption that, um, that you may be referring to the use of smartphones. And you wrote back, um, social media, for instance, needs to be used with discernment to promote the good and the true and not to spread rumors and fake news. And if we want to reach the millennials and young people, we have to learn how to use technology because that's the language they understand. My question would be, because it comes up frequently in discussions that I have with other women religious, and that is the use of these new technologies, especially smartphones, as women religious, because of how invasive we can allow them to be. And so I was just wondering if, if you might want to elaborate a little bit on that phrase that you presented of the use of technology and the spiritual life. Yeah, 
Okay. Um, I know of a lot of young people, for example, who uh, use technology, uh, like for example, in their computers, um, they, they search uh, something on spirituality and, uh, and they uh, like, you know, like, like, like online retreats, online retreat or praying and things like that which oftentimes uh, we are not familiar with as religious. We don't use it. And so that I was referring to that when I said that uh, the integration of spirituality and technology on behalf of the gospel. Now, of course, uh, what is happening now is that they are spending more time on their smartphones. And uh, to the extent that there is it, uh, there is a lot of um, connection um, through the internet, but really not true uh, relationship. So that is one of the questions that I have. And therefore, that's why I always say that we need to help them uh, you know, discern uh, in terms of their use of it is that because sometimes the, the tendency is that it becomes an addiction. Like almost anything, it can be a way of escaping, a uh, real uh, way of uh, connecting with people. And so you use uh, technology. So that's why it's, it's, uh, there's a lot that needs to be reflected upon when it comes to technology. I, I could hear uh, echo. I was wondering what's. Uh, can you hear me? I, I okay. Would anyone else like to ask a question? The floor is open. Even feedback from what came up in your groups, if you'd like to share that, that would be fine. Here we go. Okay, sister. Thank you. I was uh, wondering if sister could say a little bit more about persons who are not able to move through that first phase of the conversion process. So once they experience that darkness or confusion or some type of crisis, but for whatever the reason, they don't move beyond that, how to help them? Yes, uh, a lot of times people who are uh, undergoing the first phase really needs to be able to, they need to be able to talk to someone. Uh, like if you're living with somebody in community, for example, who is going through the first phase, to be sensitive to what that person might be going through, not to be invasive, but to be sensitive, uh, to try to encourage that person to, uh, to talk about it or to encourage a person to look for someone that uh, he or she can talk to. Uh, it's very important because what happens in the first phase, if you don't go beyond it, really, the, the ongoing conversion will not happen. I mean, only by the grace of God that it will happen, actually. Uh, uh, but um, it's, uh, it's difficult, especially in community, to be sent. I mean, it in community, we need to be sensitive to one another. Uh, sometimes people um, uh, do not want to admit that they're going through the first phase, but you can see from their attitude, from their lifestyle, from, from their activities, that there seems to be uh, an escape. They, they seem to be escaping something from their life. And uh, if they are in formation, uh, the formator has to be more sensitive to them and uh, maybe challenge them a bit to help them um, open up. Uh, and if they cannot open up to their formator, maybe suggest that maybe there's, there are ways by which the person can, you know, can open up or maybe uh, some, 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 someone else outside of the community that they can talk to. But it is crucial in this first phase that help will be available to them. how um, that's uh, it depends also on the personality of the person undergoing the first phase you know i'm saying this let me just elaborate a little bit more because uh, 
I know of someone in the community who was going through this first phase and uh, um, we did not, you know, the, the community members did not realize it, but she was getting to be more of a suicidal. And it is a good thing that uh, something happened that enabled her to admit that she needed help. Sometimes you need a breakthrough. Sometimes a person need, needs to break down in order for the breakthrough to happen. Thank you, sister. I think one of the advantages that this um, sharing is helping us see is how each of us also contributes in the spiritual walk of other people, whether we realize it or not. And at times we may be able to, to be the instrument in God's hands and being able to reach other people. Do you mind saying something about that? Uh, um, can you repeat, please? Uh, I, mean, I did not uh, get your... Can you... That we can be instrumental? Uh, exactly that. At in, what, in, what, yeah, in what way can we be instrumental or something like that? Yes, yes. Particularly because I think in, in my own um, experience with other people, there's always a hesitation to, to kind of get involved, but not get involved in the sense of, of helping them along. But... Um, even feedback at times, because there's always a certain hesitancy on my part that it's my own egoism, etc. But at the same time, we may be at times the instrument that God wants to use even to help someone just become aware. Um, can you give mm -hmm. us some feedback about that? Yeah, sometimes at the very beginning, like little acts of kindness, towards the person. So like, for example, if you notice the person is not talking, it's not, you know, just quiet a lot of times, of course you want to give that person um, space. But if it becomes more of a habitual thing, you know, I mean, you can, you, 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 it's, it's important to us, I noticed that you seem to have no energy for this or that. Is there anything I can help you with or something like that? Just very simple uh, sort of, without invade, invading uh, their privacy or whatever, maybe just even asking, how, how are you? I mean, I noticed that you don't seem to have a lot of energy or you seem to be, uh, you know, always absent or things like that. Um, so I, I think we need to develop a sensitivity, sensitivity on our part to be able to... Uh, ask the right questions, for example. Sometimes it's just simple question. How are you? You know, how are things with you? Things like that. Uh, or maybe just even inviting a person for, like, can, you know, for, for a meal or can we go for a walk or something like that. Uh, sometimes it can be just uh, that person needs to be noticed. Thank you. Yes, we have, you can, with the button on top of where your microphone is, the one right in front of you. I want to thank uh, Sister Judith for the presentation that is so rich and just following our table conversation. For us, the key word is awareness. Yes. And we are saying that awareness would open me, would open us up to the opportunities that God is offering at each phase. So when I am aware of what is happening to me, I can be conscious to know the phase in which I am, or if I am aware of what is happening to the person coming towards me, it, it can help me to enkindle life in the other in different ways, just as she is about quoting the type of questions to ask and the rest. So we really found the discussion very rich and encouraging. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Yeah, I would like also to thank you know, for the sharing we had this morning. And there is a good opportunity for this time of Advent, no? To allow us yes. to relook at the way we are living together as a community and uh, how to nourish our spiritual life. But as we were sharing on this table, we, we said this talk is challenging the way we are living now as a community or as a team when we are overburdened, when we feel we are taken about what we have to do. We don't have a time for each other. We don't have a time even. We pray, but you know, we have to pray. And we, we mm -hmm. say this also is a, a reality touching even our congregations. So we, we shared about this. Maybe you have something also you can say about uh, this balance, no? Like living life in balance, not be taken too much by to what we have to do, but uh, how to, to live a life that allows us to be present to each other, to be present to ourselves, to be present to what is happening in our life. Thank you. Yes. Yes, and I think that is one of the challenges of many religious communities because we are uh, overwhelmed by uh, a lot of times by the amount of work that um, are given to us, the amount of work that is given to us, or the many challenges that are presented to us. And if we, you are, for example, in um, leadership, um, you know, sometimes you really have to schedule time. I mean, uh, I have been working with some religious communities and I have to say to them that you have to, if, uh, because there's a tendency that you, know, you are taken over by the activities and so no more time. And so you really, we really need to plan uh, to, to give ourselves moments of silence and we really have to commit ourselves to that. Uh, it's, it's a matter of um, really um, committing ourselves to a particular structure, not so structured the way uh, it was in the past, but at least to even say that uh, we need time for recreations to get to know one another. Uh, moments of celebration are very important because uh, our life is not just all work. Uh, for us to be prophetic, we will lose our prophetic edge when, uh, when we don't give witness to life itself. We must enjoy and we must give witness to uh, the abundance of life that uh, is being offered to us by God. So uh, one, one practical thing is really we have to, <laughs> to uh, schedule in, uh, to put a schedule for relaxation, for getting to know one another, for you know, sharing, faith sharing especially is very important. Uh, not just sharing about, uh, you know, what uh, it can be homiletic in some ways, you know, faith sharing can happen in that way, but really sharing what is happening to you and how God is touching you or how God might be absent in your life at this moment. Okay. Does anyone have online? Um... One of the sisters is saying to you, Sister Judette, I thank you all so much for your contributions and especially Sister Judette for this wonderful presentation. Are there any others online who may have a question or who would like to ask, give feedback um, to Sister? And here on the floor, Echo, okay, we have one more. Yes, sure. Yes, one thing, um, I certainly appreciated the whole presentation. There's much to be thinking about. Uh, I did appreciate um, the point that uh, you made, Sister, about uh, talking about the psychological as well as the spiritual 
uh, sometimes, uh, depending upon, I suppose it might be a cultural thing, there may be a tendency to, uh, for instance, if a sister's having what would be a crisis that might be a psychological, what I would consider a psychological uh, problem, to tend to spiritualize it and try to uh, help mm -hmm. a sister only with uh, a spiritual, what we might say, retreats or special workshops. Not that that is not helpful, but um, how do you balance those two, which is actual what I would consider psychological therapy and this spiritual, the spirituality? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times we answer um, questions or we, we try to detect the problem of the person only from the spiritual point of view. Uh, so like, for example, uh, if you look at the hierarchy of calls, First, the first call is the call to be a human person. And a lot of times the problem or the challenges that come to a person is on that level of human development, for example. And therefore, uh, as you said, there, in the past, there was a tendency to solve those problems by spiritualizing it. And that's not a good thing either because uh, you, you are simply just uh, you know, helping that person escape what is the reality. Um, but at the same time, uh, there has to be a balance also that once the person is helped to realize where the problem is coming from, where the challenge is, is coming from, where is the source of darkness and so forth, then to help the person see it from a perspective of faith. Because, uh, you know, uh, the incarnation is so important for us because the first call to be a human person is the very reason why Jesus came uh, to this world. Uh, uh, the, the very reason for his incarnation is to be able to identify with each of us. And therefore, um, we cannot just skip that part. So, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, the, so the second call is the call to be a person of faith. That's where our Chris, Christian faith is. And the, the third call is really just the call to a particular lifestyle. And, and for us religious, that's what we have chosen. But sometimes, uh, for example, it might be, um, you know, the, the presenting problem might be on the area of the living the vows. But it might not be the living of the vows. It might be telling you about, you know, the first call that person has uh, is uh, not is lacking in uh, understanding of human development, or maybe an area of human development uh, is uh, where the problem is coming from, and therefore we need to be able to uh, determine uh, where is where is this person, where is this person coming from in her or his, her experience? Is she coming from? the level of the human development or is it coming from the area of faith or is it coming from the area of religious vocation i mean those are ways by which we can help uh, help the person understand where or what is going on in one's life i don't know if i'm answering your question but sometimes you know the balance is is very difficult to come up with but i think if we need to find out really where this person is coming from, where, what, where, what is the experience of this person, is to find out first. And the history of the person also is very important. And to help that person see uh, in oneself that self-awareness, which is really more on the level of human development and psychology, uh, is important facet not to spiritualize everything immediately. Anyone else here in the, the room here? Okay. So we'll go ahead and, and close for today. Um, the next event that the UISG English Speaking Group is planning is one on interculturation and mission. And that will be presented in both English and Spanish 
The presenter is Father Lazar Stanislas, who is a Divine Word missionary. And it will also be available as a webinar, too. That's great. On January 8th. So for those of you who watch your, your email, we'll be sending out the, the invitation very soon. But for today, we'd like to thank you so much, Sister Judette, for... Oh, there's also... They're showing me... Which one of you mind bringing me the... Thank you. Thank you so much. There's also a workshop here um, on the 13th of December from 9.30 to 12.30. The speaker is Marianne Lafrey. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She's a Sister of Mercy who works with the Jesuit Refugee Service. And she will be presenting uh, Who Cares for the Caregivers? And it's a reflection for sisters who work in demanding contexts and for those who accompany them. So if you'd like to participate in this meeting, you can also go online and find the information for registering for this event. Thank you so much, Sister Judette, for joining us. There's a few hours of difference between us. <laughs> so thank you for- It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure, in fact. <laughs> and when we send all of you the link for today's webinar, which will appear online. Sister has also graciously allowed us to disseminate her presentation that she sent us, so you'll also be able to have access to that as well. So thank you from all of us here, and thank you from all of us joining on the webinar, Sister Judette. Okay. Bye. Bye. Happy <laughs> Christmas. Merry, yes, uh, blessed, uh, blessed Advent, grace-filled Advent, and uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.